My name is Kathy Kleiman. I'm the founder of the ENIAC Programmers Project and uh, also an internet attorney with Fletcher Hilden Hildreth, a law firm in Washington, D.C. And I wanted to thank you for being here and Anne O'Day and her incredible staff for setting up today's event, tomorrow's event, because it gives us the opportunity to share with you stories from history that have been lost, but that everyone should know. And I'm here to share with you the story of the ENIAC programmers. So I was an undergraduate, and I was studying a lot of computer science um, a number of years ago. I'm not going to tell you the exact number. And uh, I came across, I was looking for women in computing as role models. There were very few women around me. There were very few women in my classes. There were very few women in my summer jobs. And there were very few uh, female faculty. I don't think there was any female faculty. And so I came across a picture. Um, I actually knew about Ada Lovelace and her work with uh, Charles Babbage, and I knew about Grace Hopper, who then was Captain Grace Hopper with the U.S. Navy and would go on to be Rear Admiral Grace Hopper. But Ada Lovelace was in the 19th century, and Grace Hopper was in the 20th century. And one woman successful in computing per century did not make me feel warm and fuzzy about the field. <laughs> So I went looking in history. Were there any other women? And I had been programming for seven years at that point, and I had only heard of Ada and Grace, who are marvelous. But I came across this picture. This is the ENIAC. The ENIAC was the first all-electronic programmable computer. It was a secret US Army World War II project. And um, it was eight feet tall, 80 feet long. It took up three sides of a large room, as you can see. So I found this picture, and the men were in the captions. And they deserve to be. The man leaning against the pole is Dr. John Mockley, and the person with his hand on the switch right next to him is Jay Presper Eckert. These were the co-inventors of the ENIAC. This was their vision, and they built it during the war. So of course they deserve to be in the captions. But the women, there are women in this picture. And I wanted to know who they were, and they were nowhere to be found in the captions. So I took the picture to my professor, and he sent me to a leading computer historian. This picture was taken in 1946. I was asking the questions in 1986. And the leading computer historian assured me they're models. They're women posed in front of the machine to make it look good. <laughs> and I was like, wait a second, hold on. And I went back to work, and I found more pictures of them. And I was like, wait a second, these women don't look like models. They're beautiful, don't get me wrong. But I had this theory in my head that they looked like they knew exactly what they were doing. I didn't think you could put someone in front of this huge machine and have them look as confident as these women look. The theory in my head was that they were posed for the pictures, but that as long as they were there, they were going to check the switch settings. And it turns out that's exactly what was going on, because I tracked them down. And they're not with us anymore, but I would like to introduce you to the most incredible women I've ever met. Uh, starting top left is Jean Jennings Bardick, Betty Holberton, and uh, Ruth Lichterman. Uh, no, I'm sorry. That's Fran Bylas Spence. Coming down, second row left, the gorgeous picture of Varlin Westcoff Meltzer and her best friend Ruth Lichterman Teitelbaum, and then Kay McNulty Mockley Antonelli. So I found the women. Uh, Ruth was no longer with us, but I got to know Jean, Betty, Marlon, and Kay really, really well. And they have this story to tell, the story of how they've been recruited by the Army, because for the most part, they were math majors. And during the war, the Army had run out of male math majors and needed women. And so they were brought in from all over the country. Jean came in as far as from a farm in Missouri out to Philadelphia to work on the project. If you're in the computer field, uh, from the very beginning, you're going to be the first in a lot of things. I've never since uh, never been in as exciting an environment. We knew we were pushing back frontiers. In February of 1946, six months after World War II had ended, America learned of a secret army project called ENIAC. It was the first all-electronic digital computer. Yet the tale of ENIAC's programming by a group of young women has been all but erased from computer history. During World War II, the U.S. had assembled a crew of nearly 100 mathematically trained women whose official title was computer. Women who were computing complex ballistic trajectory equations by hand and using mechanical desktop calculators. In the spring of 1945, six were selected to figure out how to program the ENIAC machine. Fran Bielis, Betty Jean Jennings, Ruth Lichterman, 
Kathleen McNulty, Betty Schneider, Marlon Westkoff. We were computing ballistic tables on a hand calculator. We were computing, and we were computers. There were logical diagrams of the ENIAC, and we were supposed to study them to figure out how to program it. The ENIAC was a son of a bitch to program. ENIAC became a legend. Eckhart and Mockley became famous. However, the ENIAC programmer story, the story of these six women founders who created the first sort routine, first software application, and became the first teachers of modern programming, was never told. Their work dramatically altered computing in the 1940s and 1950s as they paved the path to modern computer science. At that time, the emphasis was on the invention of the ENIAC, I mean, developing the mechanics, the hardware. We were like fighter pilots. I mean, here was this great, great machine, but you couldn't just take any ordinary pilot and stick him into a fighter pilot and say, go to it now, man. I mean, that was <laughs> not the way it was going to be. I had a fantastic life. Everything I did was the beginning of something new. I really loved working with those girls. A little later. So from this story, Anne asked me to share a few lessons of, of what I've learned, what I've learned from history. One is that we need to celebrate our history. We have an amazing history. And we should celebrate it, we should share it, uh, we should teach it. And so I wanted to share with you my favorite picture of celebrating the history. This is Jean Jennings Bardic in, uh, in the middle of the picture. And she's being inducted, it's uh, 2008, and she's being inducted by the Computer History Museum in, as, as a computer fellow, kind of into their fellowship ranks. And uh, to her left is Linus Torwalls, who created Linux, and to her right is Bob Medcalf, who created Internet and founded 3Com, which was a network service company, a network product company for a long time. And so uh, that night was an incredible night in 2008 as the ENIAC programmers formally entered uh, computer history, which was phenomenal. The second slide I'd like to share is that we need to work together to make our history more visible. This is a picture of me uh, interviewing Kay, and then that's uh, the back of Betty's head. And um, I didn't know anything about video, so I didn't know anything about oral histories when I started this. So if I can do it, anybody can do it. There are totally untold stories of our grandmothers and great aunts and cousins. Please join me in, in capturing these stories and sharing them. I have the ENIAC Programmers Project website, eniacprogrammers.org. And if there's no place else to send your video, send it to me and we'll post it and create links to it so people can see these amazing histories. If we don't capture them now, they will be lost. And it's really important that we make this history visible and viable and shareable because women have done amazing, amazing things throughout the history of science and technology, but somehow we don't know. Please, please, please seek attribution for your work. You know, I know at the end of the day, when we go back to our kids and back to other projects, it's hard to write the papers. It's hard to put your name on them. It's hard to brag in a blog posting. But please do it. It sends a message to your colleagues and to your managers and to young professionals around you and to students and to the future that women were very involved. If you don't do it, it's hard for future historians. So I, pro I wrote, you know, leave breadcrumbs for future historians. And this paper, um, which you can't quite see in the slide, it's, it's kind of a, a copy of an old paper. And um, when I first met Betty Holberton, she had had a stroke. And she was telling me these stories of creating the first sort routine, which later became the first software application for UNIVAC 1, which was the first commercial computer. And there was some, you know, again, I, I was told the women were models and that they hadn't done anything very important. And there was some question about the accuracy of what Betty was telling me. And so I said, wait, let me look and see if I can find some other confirmation of, her, of this work, of these stories she's telling me. And I went to the Library of Congress, and there it was, this paper. And it, it absolutely confirmed everything she was saying. It was written just after her work at UNIVAC. And um, after that, nobody questioned her memory anymore. It was, it was very, very accurate. So please, please put your names on things and let people know. 
This is my fourth piece of advice, and this one's a little hard to talk about. I wasn't sure whether to talk about it, but it's been so valuable in my life, I wanted to share it with you, which is consider staying involved even part-time. There are parts of our lives where some of us are going to want to work and have the opportunity to work part-time. And Millie Koss, who's actually on the right, not on the left, that's her daughter on the left, um, taught me something that I wound up using in my life. And so she worked at UNIVAC, she worked under Grace Hopper, she worked with Betty Holberton, and she worked in Philadelphia, and she worked full-time when she was younger. Then she moved to Boston with her husband and continued working in high tech, but she had children in the 60s, and she didn't want to work full-time. And she took a piece of a project home with her. There was no telecommuting in those days. This was flexibility. She took a piece of a project that wasn't cutting edge. It was actually bleeding edge. It was kind of past the cutting edge. It wasn't something that was competitive. I think it was a piece, if I remember correctly, of a, an early printer project. And she took it home, she took the sheets home, and she worked on them when her kids went to school. She worked on them in the basement. And she mailed in the results. Occasionally, she visited the company. Um, and she, you know, and they mailed her new materials. And she kept working on kind of this cutting edge printer technology. And when she chose to go back to work, she went back to work full time, and she was an expert in a brand new area. And when I met her many years later, she was still associate director of the Office for Information Technology at Harvard. She had worked for 47 years. And part of that was part-time, and part of that was full-time. But this idea of finding a project that you're passionate about and taking it home was interesting. So I tried it. I had young children in, uh, in the early 2000s. And working as a lawyer was 60, 80 hours a week, and that was too much. So I took home a piece of a, a project that nobody really cared about. A small group cared about it. But I was passionate about it. It had to do with early internet governance and how we govern the internet, how we create a private international system to run the domain name system. And um, we wound up creating principles and framework for what became ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. And 15 years later, no one remembers that I work part-time. They remember that I'm one of the founders of ICANN. And so I, I, I share this with you. Take home something that you're passionate about and work on it and become the expert, and it makes it much easier to come back into the workforce. And I thank Millie for that information. So in conclusion, I share with you the story, and I ask you to please pass it on, the story of the ENIAC programmers, the story of the women at Bletchley Park. Please take these stories with you and share it with the next generation, share it with anybody who will listen, because these are amazing stories of pioneers we should all know about. And join us tonight in Marion Square Park. We'll, we will be showing the computers. That orange uh, bar has been updated to talk about the Irish premiere. Um, we were in New York recently, so uh, this is the computers. It's a 20-minute documentary short, and it's the programmers telling their story in more detail. And as you saw, they're absolutely wonderful. And Jean will say, Eniac was a son of a bitch to program one more time. <laughs> Thank you very much.